We had come to take it all for granted. The best and the brightest had produced the right stuff. America was king of the new frontier. When it came to putting people in space, we were number one. Sure, there were delays and there were cost overruns, but that was the price of gaining the knowledge, sending back the pictures, and most of all, ensuring the safety of our astronauts. And then... And then, January 28th, 1986, became one of those days that no matter how long you lived, you'll remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard the news. The shuttle Challenger had blown up 73 seconds into its flight. Everyone asked, how could it happen? Well, now, four months later, the Presidential Commission investigating the shuttle tragedy is about to issue its report. And tonight, Tom Gerald tells us what went wrong and why. Good morning, and welcome to our series of background briefings on Space Shuttle Mission 51L. Just a little overview of the flight. Launch date uh, is January 22nd on Orbiter OV-99, the Challenger. Uh, Liftoff time right now is scheduled for 1940 GMT. Nominal end of mission landing time is uh, six days, zero hours and 34 minutes MET, and that's about two o'clock in the afternoon Central Standard Time. December 22nd, 1985. One month before it's scheduled to fly, the Space Shuttle Challenger is rolled out of the Vehicle Assembly Building to its Oceanside launch pad. This will be the 11th trip for Challenger itself, the 25th for the shuttle program. It's the first mission to carry an ordinary citizen, schoolteacher Krista McCullough. Space is for everybody. And when you think of the future, uh, there's going to be people flying in space, and it's going to be those kids that are in our classrooms. So it's... it's a wonderful, wonderful spot. First launched in 1981, the space shuttle is a highly sophisticated craft that must transition the Earth's atmosphere, perform tasks in outer space, return to Earth and be reused. In order to become commercially successful, the flight schedule had become increasingly ambitious. Nine flights in 1985, 15 scheduled for 1986. But behind the routine, a system under increasing strain. In other words, you, once this one gets launched, for example, you don't even have a time to uh, wipe your brow, you know? You got another one coming right behind you, you know? So you gotta make Vince Vandenberg, Space Shuttle Ground Crew Supervisor. And uh, yes, I mean, this bang, bang, back and forth with no let up. The system had also been weakened by other factors. A manpower shortage affected many key areas, including quality control. This was a problem for us many times, that jobs were basically held up or slowed up because of no quality control. A spare part shortage forced workers to cannibalize other vehicles for parts. We've robbed one vehicle to fly another. You may have one item to support four vehicles, so you got to go find the damn thing. And sometimes this is actually what we do, fine. And this isn't the way that system should be. NASA was launching an extremely complex machine on an accelerating schedule, but the support system had deteriorated. One member of the Presidential Commission would later report that it had become a blueprint for disaster. The images from space mask a range of very serious problems, accidents waiting to happen. One of the most serious problems involved the rocket boosters, designed to be reused after each flight. The joint that connects the segments of the rocket booster is a system in which the upper segment fits into the slot of the lower segment. The joint is completed by two rubber O-rings. After rocket ignition, the explosive pressure causes the segments to bulge, enlarging the gap in the joint. By that time, the first O-ring is expected to have moved into position, sealing the gap. If the gap does not seal, Hot gases from the booster could leak out, leading to a catastrophic accident. The Presidential Commission would later find that the joint was flawed, and there were warnings about it nine years ago. In this 1977 memo, NASA engineer William Ray states, the joint is unacceptable and recommends redesign. And in this 1979 memo, Ray cites concerns that the O-ring was being asked to perform beyond its intended design. 
But despite these and other warnings, the problem was never corrected. And by the end of July 1985, out of 19 flights, nine had experienced some degree of erosion on the seals. In a July 31st, 1985 memo, Morton Thiokol engineer Roger Beaujolais urged immediate action. He recently read the memo at a presidential commission hearing. It is my honest and very real fear that if we do not take immediate action to dedicate a team to solve the problem, then we stand in jeopardy of losing a flight along with all the launch pad facilities. Richard Cook was a budget analyst with NASA in the summer of 1985. A plan was developed to make a repair uh, that was not going to be implemented for well over a year. And I think during that time, people were just going to kind of hope that nothing went wrong. January 23rd, 1986. Unaware of the problems with the booster joint, the crew of Flight 51L lands at the Kennedy Space Center to prepare for launch. There have already been four launch delays, caused in part by record delays on the previous flight. Launch is now scheduled for Sunday, January 26th. The commander of the flight is Dick Scobie. It's a real pleasure to be at the Cape to come down here and participate in something that the Cape does better than anybody in the world, and that's launching space vehicles. A decorated uh, Air Force pilot, Scobie served a tour in Vietnam. This is his second mission on the shuttle. A lot of folks down here pilot Mike Smith. We understand it's ready to go, and we're looking forward to going to fly. Smith, who grew up on a chicken farm in North Carolina, was also a decorated pilot and served in Vietnam. This is his first journey in space. Mission specialist Ron McNair. We look forward to returning, launching from the Cape, first of all, and returning here a few days later. McNair, who had picked cotton as a boy in South Carolina, received his doctorate in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He had flown on the Challenger in February 1984. Mission Specialist Judy Resnick. Born in Akron, Ohio, Resnick received a doctorate in electrical engineering. She flew on the shuttle Discovery that was launched in August 1984. Mission Specialist Ellison Onizuka. Onizuka grew up on the Kona coast in Hawaii and is an aerospace engineer. This is his second space flight. Payload Specialist Greg Jarvis. Born in Detroit, a satellite engineer with Hughes Aircraft. And finally, school teacher Krista McCullough. And I just hope everybody tunes in on day four now to watch the teacher teaching from space. I'd like A teacher at Concord High School in Concord, New Hampshire, Krista McCullough was chosen by NASA as the first ordinary person to fly in space. Monday, January 27th, 6.45 a.m the flight crew of the Challenger leaves for pad 39B. The launch of flight 51L is now scheduled for 9.37 a.m. It's been delayed five times, the latest slip caused by predicted bad weather at the Cape the day before. NASA officials are concerned that the delays will interfere with the other 13 shuttle flights scheduled for this year. The crew suits up in the white room, the room that provides access to the orbiter. At 721, the crew enters the cabin. We got a problem on removing one of the screws. At 922, the ground crew encounters a problem removing the latch on the cabin door. After considerable difficulty, the latch is finally removed. Launch is now scheduled for 12.06 p.m. We're at T-minus 19 minutes, 58 seconds, and counting. But crosswinds have kicked up, and the launch is scrubbed and rescheduled for the next day, Tuesday, January 28th, at 9.38 a.m. This is shuttle launch control. The weather in the Florida area is going to continue to get much colder. As the disappointed crew exits the cabin, it's predicted that the temperatures will drop below freezing overnight, reaching 26 degrees by launch time in the morning. It will be colder than any previous launch. 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Morton Thiokol engineers meet at the company's plant in Brigham City, Utah, to discuss the effects of the cold on the rocket boosters. Engineer Roger Beaujolais was there. That meeting concluded with the uh, tempo that there was a valid concern for temperature, low temperature. A telephone conference, or a telecon, is set up between the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, where the rocket design is supervised, and Thiokol's Utah plant. The telecon begins at 9 p.m. 
So that night, uh, we presented the information on the basis of what we knew. And what we knew, and I feel very strong about it, is that we had a problem with temperature. The engineers had reviewed test data indicating that cold temperatures caused the rubber O-rings in the joint to become harder, less likely to seal the gap in the joint. The conclusions were that we should not fly outside of our database, which was 53 degrees. But Lawrence Malloy and other NASA officials object to Thiokol's recommendation not to launch. That was an engineering conclusion, which uh, I found this conclusion without basis, and I challenged his logic. NASA official George Hardy states that he is appalled at Thiokol's position, but also says that they would not fly without Thiokol's concurrence. At 10.15 p.m., Morton Thiokol, feeling pressure to change their no-launch recommendation, asked for time off the line for a caucus in Utah. The meeting is split between Thiokol management, led by senior vice president Gerald Mason, and Thiokol engineers, led by Roger Beaujolais. So, we spoke out and tried to explain, once again, the effects on low temperature. But Arnie. Beaujolais and the other engineers are overruled. Mr. Mason said, we have to make a management decision. He turned to Bob Blunt and asked him to take off his engineering hat and put on his management hat. Mason then conducts a poll of Thiokol management. And we did conduct that poll, and then we did conclude that it was, it was uh, safe to launch. I did not agree with some of the statements that were being made to support the decision. I was never asked nor polled. At Cape Canaveral, Thiokol engineer Alan McDonald told NASA officials that he also remained opposed to the launch. In fact, I uh, made the direct statement that if anything happened to this launch, uh, I told him I sure wouldn't want to be the person that had to stand in front of a board of inquiry. But despite the objections of the engineers, at 11.30 p.m., Morton Thiokol telefaxes NASA its final recommendation to launch. That night, as predicted, the temperatures at Cape Canaveral drop below freezing. That wind comes off of that ocean, and it is cold. And so you, you notice the cold more down there than you do probably elsewhere. And yes, it was cold. January 28th, 1986, 1.30 a.m., NASA sends an ice team to inspect the severe ice conditions on the pad. The team also records temperatures of 9 and 23 degrees on the solid rocket boosters, but does not report the findings to the launch director. Under procedure, it was not required. This is shuttle uh, launch control at T minus 2 hours, 28 minutes and counting. Here comes the 51-hour uh, flight crew. 7.48 a.m., the countdown proceeds. As the flight crew once again leaves for the pad, there's continuing concern about the ice conditions. One contractor, Rockwell, continues to oppose launch. We still are at a position that uh, is a bit of a Russian roulette. 8.13 a.m., the crew arrives at the White Room. A member of the closeout crew presents the teacher with an apple. At Concord High School, students are preparing to watch the launch in the auditorium. All my faith was in NASA. I didn't think that they'd ever launch anything that they weren't sure about, especially when they had, you know, passengers. 9.04 a.m., the crew cabin is sealed. A senior NASA management meeting gives the final go for launch. Rockwell's concerns about the ice are inadequately communicated. The effects of the cold on the solid rocket boosters is not discussed. The Presidential Commission later revealed that NASA's lines of communications were poor, that crucial life and death decisions were not reaching senior management levels. Good morning, Kristen. Hope we go today. Good morning, hope so too. And there's so much happening in, in the auditorium. There's so much buzzing, you know. At Mission Control Houston, the flight director is Jay Green. We were in the flow from the countdown the day before, and it, it, everything was right. This is the walkway used by the astronauts to climb in the vehicle, and that arm can be put back in place within a... The ascent probably excites me more than anything because it's so much happening in such a short period of time. T-minus two minutes and counting. The liquid hydrogen... They're going to try to use the booster rockets and get it up into the orbit, but if things fail, they can land, which is a, a nice feeling. T-minus 15 seconds. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff.
A split second after ignition, smoke emerges near the joint between the rear segments of the right booster. The joint has failed and gases are burning through. The smoke continues for two and a half seconds and then temporarily stops. But the smoke is not seen by the controllers and the Challenger continues its ascent. During the first phases of flight, there's, a, there's not much you can do. So you tend to scan the systems. And uh, we did that, and everything was looking uh, just as it should. Increased pressure on the accelerating vehicle and strong crosswinds violently jar the already weakened seal. At 58 seconds, the joint fails again and a plume of flame appears on the right booster. The plume from the booster intensifies as it burns through and deflects onto the large external tank. Like a giant blowtorch, the plume ruptures the external tank. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. At 73 seconds, an intense flash fire rapidly erupts, causing the total and final breakup of the vehicle. At mission control, shock as seen in this film obtained first by 2020. I remember seeing th the smoke and some kind of separation. There was still a lot of noise and people were screaming and the poppers were still going off. And that's when a teacher yelled down from the balcony for everyone to be quiet. Something had happened. And it was like dead silence. At mission control, all contact is lost with the Challenger. Nobody knew exactly what happened. The solid rocket boosters break away and head downrange, uncontrolled toward the Florida coast. At 110 seconds after liftoff, an Air Force officer destroys the boosters by remote control. Flight controller Green has received a report that radar is tracking multiple pieces. That was the worst thing you can hear in that job. Uh, and it stops you. It stops you cold. Green asked his colleagues, was there any sign of trouble? Nothing, so I looked at all the swim attempts are perfect, right on the prediction. Arm you. We look good, fine. DPS. All our data's normal. Crop. Everything looked good, fine. Tomorrow, June 6th, the Presidential Commission will present its report to the White House. The report will recommend a major redesign of the flawed booster joint and other troubled parts, including the brakes, main engines, and fuel valves. It will recommend sweeping changes in NASA's management structure and the launch decision-making process. And it will recommend that the astronauts play a more active role throughout the shuttle program. As for those involved in Flight 51L, NASA official Lawrence Malloy has been reassigned. NASA official George Hardy has retired. Martin Thakal, Senior Vice President Gerald Mason, has announced his retirement. Morton Thakal engineers Alan McDonald and Roger Beaujolais have been chosen to lead the company's efforts to redesign the booster rocket. Jay Green continues as flight director. They were good friends, and uh, the loss was personal. The loss was professional. And a lot of us were complacent, I think, you know, by the, yeah. uh, by the 24th shuttle launch. We, it had become so routine. I think we all had, had forgotten that those compromises from design to denial of danger were going to blow up in tragedy on the, on the 25th. How long do you think now? Is that year they plan realistic? They're talking launch? about the next launch of something like July of 1987, roughly a year from now. But our sources say that's an extremely optimistic uh, schedule. They have major redesign and testing problems with the, uh, the rocket booster seals and the, the joints that were faulty in this one. So it's going to take a while and probably uh, the end of next year would be more realistic. More realistic. I don't think it's the end of the shuttle program. It's a setback like the Apollo 1 was. Not by any means. And to their credit, they have compiled a phenomenal safety record when you think of where they've traveled and the adventures we've sure. seen in space. Um, to be hit by such a catastrophe is sad. Thank you, Tom. <laughs>